Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. I am joined today by Maggie Fisher. Maggie, welcome to the event space. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's absolutely our pleasure. We're really excited to talk to you and hear what you've got to tell us and teach us. Today, we're talking all about LLCs, copyrights, contracts, all the fun stuff, the things that nobody ever really wants to talk about, but it's really important that we do talk about keeps us, you know, from, from messing everything up, right? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So we're super excited to have you here, Maggie. Uh, as always, if you're joining us here on Zoom and you have any questions for Maggie, please feel free to get them in on the Zoom side of things. Use the Q&A tab and that's how we can ask her those questions. If you're joining us on live stream or Facebook, go ahead and drop those questions into the comment section and we'll get them forwarded over so that we can present them to her as well. Otherwise, I know Maggie's got some great stuff planned for us, so I'm going to get out of the way and I'll come back at the end and we'll tackle those questions and get an answer for you. But Maggie, thanks again for being here. I'll see you in a little bit. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of information about me and who I am and what I do. Um, like Scott said, my name is Maggie. I am the artist lawyer and I'm from Ocean City, New Jersey. Um, I always like to preface legal conversations by saying that I know that legal topics can be pretty dull and monotonous. It's not the most fun thing to talk about. And I always say it's like going to the dentist. You don't want to call your lawyer unless you really have to. You're probably not going to the dentist unless you have cavities. But if you're staying on top of things, it's always a good sign. Um, I like to make law more approachable, more relatable, and more on brand with the kind of services that we perform as artists and creatives. We are all having to deal with contracts a lot more than we have in the past. Um, I'm, I know a lot of photographers have been posting about force majeure and COVID clauses over the last year and a half. Um, and that's a lot of what I you know, help with today. Um, but we're going to make the legal side of running your business a little bit more useful, less stressful, more approachable, and just make sure that you have everything in good working order if you're already running your business or if you're thinking about setting it up. So um, I am both a lawyer and a photographer. I have a large photography studio that's based on the East Coast. We have 12 associate photographers that work for us. And this year we had over 100 weddings. We have about 110. Uh, my husband and I shoot about 25 of them. We also have a photo booth company. So we are offering our photo booth services as an add-on and for a separate event. So we are like in it with you guys as photographers and um, servicing clients in the real world. I'm also a practicing attorney. I graduated law school three years ago. I photographed weddings all through law school. I never knew how I would combine both of my passions. And I um, focused on intellectual property and small business while I was in law school because it was something that was interesting to me. Um, I took a lot of classes on trademark and copyright and um, small business law, legal entities. Um, I did directed research on Instagram and copyright issues and um, how there's no real set re repercussions once your image is stolen online. There's no real way to measure damages if you were to want to send an invoice to a company. So um, that's something that I'm very passionate about as well. Um, after law school, I clerked for an appellate judge. I had an offer to go full time at um, a firm that I had been working at. And um, I ended up having to make a decision about which path I was going to continue down. Um, it, I wasn't able to work at a firm full time and also continue to photograph weddings. So I ended up having to make a decision about what path I was going to go down. I ended up giving up the traditional law route and opening my own small firm, The Artist Lawyer, where I um, put together contract templates, tools, and resources for small business owners that I, I didn't find that there were resources like that out there for me that really um, understood exactly what I needed in my small business and as an artist to not only protect me, but also make clients not feel like it was this crazy legal jargon that I'm presenting to them. 
Um, so the artist lawyer has been a marriage of my two crafts, my passions, and that makes me super excited to talk to you guys today. Um, I know entrepreneurship is not easy. I, as a small business owner with multiple businesses, um, I know that there's so many things that you have to tackle, so many hats that you have to wear. And law is one of those things that you shouldn't have to wear that hat. You shouldn't have to figure it out and do it yourself. Um, so that is one of the reasons that I do what I do, that I provide these resources and why I like to jump on webinars like this and answer questions and provide any insight that I can. So over the years of working with various artists and creatives, I like to always start with the basics because I have found that not all artists and creatives have that base foundation of um, setting up your businesses to be professionally safe and sound. The first thing that I always like to talk about is your legal entity for your business. A lot of the time that will actually be an LLC. Um, you may be a sole proprietor, you may open up a corporation, but it is super important that you think through what kind of legal entity you want your business to be and that you do actually separate it out and form that separate legal entity. There's a lot of vendors and small business owners, photographers who are operating without that separate business entity. And that's risky for a number of reasons. By separating out your LLC, you're able to open up a separate business bank account and run your profit and loss through that business bank account, which makes it really easy for organization of your business for tax purposes. It also will um, protect your personal assets by removing your business as a separate entity, um, say, something were to ever happen and somebody were to sue you, they wouldn't be able to come after your personal assets so long as you're properly running everything through that business entity. Things like your home, um, your personal belongings, your car would not be able to be pulled into like a lawsuit for damages or um, collection if anything were to happen. So legal protection wise, super important that you have this separate business entity. I also think it just looks a lot more professional too when you have that separate business entity and your clients are writing checks to an LLC or your business organization. Um, they're seeing it on your contract. It just makes you look like you have properly set your business up and that you're taking your business seriously. If you do already have this in place, you may have already completed this step. You may be like at the forefront of starting to form your business and looking into like what might be best for you. Um, but even if you have started your LLC or your business entity, it's very important that you maintain that entity and keep it in good standing with the government. That means every year that you have to file an annual report. Um, I see a lot of photographers and creatives miss this step where you might forget that you have to keep up with that every year to keep it in good standing. My biggest tip is to set a reminder in your calendar every year. Like say for me, it's every July, we file our annual reports. There's like a, I think it's a 30 or a $50 fee. And that keeps your business entity in good standing, um, which is important for just keeping up that, that maintenance with your LLC and knowing that it's still legit and valid. Um, so something that you guys can do right now is just even if you have your LLC, make sure you're filing those annual reports. And um, if not, set that up. That's something you can do real quick on the internet today. And then put that little calendar notification in your reminders so that you're keeping up with that every year. The next thing that is super important as a small business owner um, and as a photographer who's servicing clients is to have insurance in place. Um, I'm sure that you have heard the ins and outs of insurance before, um, but from a legal perspective, it is extremely important to not only make sure that you're protected 
um, in case of any kind of like liability that may come up while you're servicing a client or in an event space, um, but also to protect your gear. If something were to get stolen, you can file a claim or if something got severely damaged, you may be able to have insurance help you with replacing that equipment. Every year we update our equipment list with our insurance so that they know what equipment we have, what the serial numbers are, what the value is, so if anything were to happen, any kind of like disaster or theft or anything that might happen, we know that we have all of that equipment protected. Another really important aspect um, of in your insurance will be data loss and data protection. Something that's very relevant for photographers since we're shooting on memory cards and utilizing technology to deliver our products to our clients. So really going through your insurance with a fine tooth comb, I know it's so boring to read, um, but get on the phone with whoever your insurance provider is and know like exactly what is covered in your insurance policy. See if data recovery is included. See to what extent these kinds of things or any of your concerns are outlined in your policy. Um, I had a client a couple years ago who actually had their second photographer accidentally, they accidentally lost their files on their memory card. They had done something like, I think they had left it in a car in the heat. Um, and it can cost thousands of dollars to get those files recovered. Um, I hope none of you have been there, but um, from what I had learned, there were, I think the fees were like five to $7,000 to get this memory card recovered. And that was actually something that their insurance provider was able to comp like reimburse them for um, because they had coverage under their policy for that kind of circumstance. So definitely something in this type of world that you want to make sure is in your insurance and that you ha actually have that insurance in place for. Um, in your business practice, another way that you can protect yourself with um, situations like this and all kinds of situations that might occur is with your contracts. Contracts are the number one thing that I do in my legal practice. I do a lot of custom contracts. I do a lot of um, redlining and reviewing of contracts that may be presented by a corporation to a commercial photographer that's being hired and making sure that the artist is protected. Um, and I do a lot of dispute resolution as well. So jumping in and helping a photographer who may be in a legal, legal battle um, or just a, a conflict that's, that maybe has come up and involves their contract with a client or um, you know, any other kind of circumstance. So I have some things that are just general tips for your contracts. Of course, the first thing is having a contract and actually having one in place in your business. There are a lot of photographers, even I have worked with some of like the top photographers in the country and some of them don't use contracts. Like they still operate by handshake deals and good faith. And it might work for some people, you know, especially when you're at the top of the market in the industry, maybe like you can operate on good faith <laughs> because you hope that somebody won't cross you if you have that big of a name. Um, but it still happens. I still see it happen. And it's so important, not only for you, but also for the client to have everything outlined in a contract so that it's very clear um, what exactly is being provided, how it's being provided, um, you're protected, they're protected, everything is super, super clear and on the table. Um, and one of the things that I do within contracts is make sure that everything is very, 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 very explicitly outlined. Why retainers are non-refundable for holding dates and how travel fees work and reimbursements if, say, like, you had to quarantine somewhere for a destination wedding that you were photographing. So I really dive into a lot of details. The biggest, other than not having contracts, the biggest mistake that I see photographers and creatives make is not using a lawyer drafted or lawyer approved contract. 
there are so many ways to get a contract. And um, I've seen photographers use contracts from Etsy, from marketplaces, from their friends, from like a free download on the internet. And the problem with that is these other sources out there in the world don't have the same kind of ethical standards and liability for providing legal advice. And they're often not getting the whole picture. They may be missing clauses or have conflicting clauses. So it's really, really important that you use a lawyer drafted, lawyer approved contract and that you keep it up to date. I always encourage reflecting on your contracts as a regular part of your business practice. So if things come up, say like in the heat of the season, um, going back and revisiting your contracts and making sure, um, you know, say something comes up, seeing how exactly your contract would have this situation play out. Um, and going back and adding in anything that may be new or may not have been thought of before in the past. That's something that you can bring to an attorney on a yearly basis and make sure that you have these situations or these added clauses covered um, and inserted in. It's, it should be, in my opinion, um, a regular cost of doing business to check in with your attorney, to have your contract reviewed, to have your contract updated. Um, because say, you know, you have even just one situation where there is a retainer that's questionable, whether it could be refunded or not, or somebody's finding you for a payment back, your lawyer fees are probably not even going to amount to like what that, that might've been that you could have to refund or lose. Um, so it's always just important to make that initial like upfront investment to protecting yourself, peace of mind, um, and know that you don't have to like lose sleep over whether or not you have to refund somebody. Um, over the last year and a half, I've received a lot of questions and done a lot of um, revisions on contracts in regards to COVID. Um, the first thing that I do with contracts, generally speaking, is revise just like the general flow and format of them the contract templates that I provide and the contracts that I restructure um, all get reworked so that there's more of a flow to them and they read more like a manual to the relationship and a guide versus a very static like Roman numeral one, thou shall not do this and Roman numeral two, thou shall not do that. Um, that can be very jarring. It can get, that's where things can get um, conflicting or overwhelming because you may be adding things in and you might not know like what conflicts with what or where things go. So I like to restructure contracts and make sure that there's like a rhyme and a reason to them, that they're organized, that they flow, that they don't read so legalese, but more like a manual and a guide to the relationship making it a lot more friendly and digestible to the client. Substantively, I think a lot of us have, um, if you're in the wedding industry or the events industry, I'm sure you've revisited your contract in the last year and a half. Um, a lot of people have revisited rescheduling and cancellation, um, postponement policies to make sure that their contract reflects um, the practice that they want to have in place in these kinds of situations. I always like to preface these conversations around COVID by saying, um, you know, contracts are here for a reason. We have to charge retainers to run a sustainable and a professional business. And it is okay to stick by your contracts. Um, you can only serve your clients well by having these, these systems in place and these um, aspects of your contract in place. So it's, it's important that you stick by whatever you might have in your contract. Um, and COVID does not necessarily, it does not change contract law. Um, that is why we have these contracts in place for a reason. And 
you know, as you go back and think through what your policies are um, and take on new clients over the next year, it is okay to stick by those policies if things happen that make, make situations difficult. Um, I think it's always okay too to be sympathetic and like try to work well with your clients and, um, you know, resolve things. Or, you know, I see a lot of times in Facebook groups that photographers will say it's a red flag if a client comes back and wants to like push back on a contract and change things from the outset and from the get go. Um, and I am of the mindset that I would rather have you know, a negotiation and a, and a discussion about the contract and know that my client has fully read it and assented to everything that is in there. You know, you can make little changes here and there that you're okay with compromising on. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be so black and white. Um, there is a clause that you can have in your contract called a non-waiver clause that actually allows you to go lighter than what your contract says. So, I'm of the philosophy that your contract can be the bad guy. You can be the good guy. Say, for example, you have a late fee clause in your contract that allows you to charge, uh, I don't know, 5% or 10% of a fee. If a client is late on their payment, you can go lighter than what your contract says so long as you have a non-waiver clause in place. So there's, there's a little bit of like malleability um, in the contract world and in the legal world, it doesn't have to be so black and white. All right. Um, and when things come up in regards to your contract, um, say you have a conflict of some sort. Um, I've seen a lot of this lately with how crazy the season is um, and tensions can be high. Um, I have I see a lot of, you know, cancellations and clients demanding a refund or say they're not happy with something for some reason. They may ask for like additional rounds of editing or I don't know, some, they may ask for something that goes beyond the scope of the contract that you um, have, you know, promised services for under a specific amount. So I always like to tell clients of mine and um, anyone who comes to me for advice to just let it sit for a little bit, take a breather, um, don't jump the gun on responding right away. I see a lot of creatives feeling the need to over explain or, um, you know, really kind of like justify like why they're, why something is the way it is in their contract or why this retainer is in place or why it's non-refundable. Um, so I like to always tell everybody to just take a step back, don't respond right away, um, and then channel your inner CEO. You don't need to include personal information. You don't need to over explain. You don't need to write paragraphs if a situation like this comes up. Um, just take a step back and write it like you're the CEO of Starbucks or Target. You know, these things happen. It's a generic response. Try to remove any personal attachment to it. Um, and write it like it might be read aloud one day, like in a room like this or post it on a review in a screenshot. Um, you know, make sure that it's clear, it's concise, it's to the point and, um, you know, just kind of leave it, leave it at that. In, a, in the worst case scenario, um, if you're dealing with a very, um, you know, legal happy client who's like threatening an attorney or I'm going to sue you, um, just contact an, an attorney for assistance. You can have somebody guide you in the right direction. You can have somebody settle whatever is going on on your behalf and communicate on your behalf. Um, I know as a creative, it can be very emotionally draining to deal with these kinds of situations and take away from the work that you do. So don't be afraid to you know, just, just take a step back and pass it off to somebody else who can handle it for you so that you can concentrate on your own work. The next, um, once you have all of these things in place, so, you know, you have your LLC, you have 
insurance, you have your contracts in place. You may have all of this already all set. If you've been in business for a couple of years, um, you may, you know, feel very good about all this. The next thing that you may want to do in your business is grow and expand. Um, a lot of people start to go into the education markets or, um, to grow their team and grow their visibility, expand like to different states or destination. One thing that you can do in preparation of expanding your business is have a trademark over your brand name or any creative brand identity within your business. A trademark is a unique brand identifier. And by applying for a federal register or registering it federally, um, you are essentially putting the United States on notice and everybody in it that this is your brand, that this is your name, and this is associated with this type of work. And nobody else can use that name in that kind of industry, um, which allows you to confidently grow and expand without worrying that another business will pop up with the same kind of name. The sooner that you do this, the better, especially as you start to expand your touch points in today's world where, um, you know, everything's on the internet. There's so many different types of social media. It's really important that, you know, the more that you're putting your brand and your business name out there that you have it protected and you you have the highest amount of protection um, because the more that you invest in your brand the more valuable that is the more difficult it would be to have to start over or just grapple with having another business of the same name pop up um, my husband had a small clothing company back in the day and something similar happened to him he started developing his clothing brand. It was doing really well. And another business in Florida popped up with the same name. He did not take my advice <laughs> to register his trademark um, from the get-go. He was like, it's small, it's small, it doesn't need it. Um, this other brand popped up, took a very similar social media handle. Um, they were kind of in their respective areas, but he couldn't do anything about it. We couldn't shut it down. We couldn't um, let them know that this was confusing and infringing on something that he had already created. And if we had filed for that trademark and gotten it in place, then we would have been able to shut that down. We would have immediately been able to contact Instagram, report the username and have that taken down or ask them, you know, let them know that we have a trademark. This is confusing and infringing on the mark that we have. Please change your name. Um, and it, it can be very debilitating to think about like rebranding and like starting over and all of that, especially when you've already invested and like grown your brand and, and, you know, whatever kind of ways you, you have. So just something, something to think about. Um, the next step in growth is adding people onto your team. So you may already have contractors or team members that you work with. We have an associate team. We have 12 photographers that work for us. Um, we also have a lot of like internal team members. So we have um, a contractor who helps with marketing and social media and submissions. We have a virtual assistant. We have an in-house editor. Um, these are all team members who we have gone through the process of determining, you know, whether or not they're a contractor or an employee, um, what their pay rates are going to be, and then properly onboarding them to our team. So the first thing that you're going to want to do um, when you do start to expand your team, depending if they're client facing or not, you'll want to make sure your client contract, the contract that you have with the clients that you're servicing actually allows you to provide a team member and to expose their information to somebody else that's working with you. Um, I have had a few clients in the past who have brought on consultants or, um, like other, other photographers, other editors, and their client contract does not specify that anybody else may, may be working on their services. Um, and in these situations, I've had 
um, you know, their, their clients essentially refuse to pay on the contract and their, their contract didn't protect them because their client contract um, didn't allow and incorporate their team into their services agreement. Onboarding your team, you're going to want to make sure you're following the proper steps. Um, so making sure you have appropriate insurance coverage, another fun time to call your insurance agent and make sure that you have the appropriate coverage in place. Um, and then onboard your client, your contractor or your employee properly. So getting them filed with um, their taxes and having them sign a contract that protects your intellectual property or trade secrets or client list, um, defines their pay rates and their responsibilities, any guidelines, um, anything else that, that is specific to their work that you want to make sure is um, specifically outlined and protected for your business. So um, we went over a lot of things <laughs> very quickly. I wanted to cram it all in there. Um, a lot of really valuable things from business entities and insurance, contracts, trademarks, growing a team. Um, and, you know, any, I'm going to open up for questions. I think we have one that may already um, be here in the group. Um, you guys, I know you can go back and watch this video, but I hope that um, some of this information just helps you set up your business a little bit more professionally so that you can focus on your artwork, your creations, the things that you do best, um, and not worry so much about um, the legalese and the nitty gritty of making sure your business is legally protected. So let's open up to questions if that works for you, Scott. Yeah, definitely, um, definitely works for me, Maggie. Uh, thanks so much for, for, for being here and for, you know, giving us a, a nice in-depth rundown of, you know, <laughs> some, some really good information that, you know, I think a lot of people tend to gloss over and ignore. Mm -hmm. um, definitely in, in my past past attempted business days <laughs> definitely yeah definitely definitely spoke to me in the in the terms of you know just going on the internet and you know trying to find something that the haphazard way instead of going and contacting a professional lawyer or anything like that so definitely definitely hit home there <laughs> <laughs> um so as as maggie said you know if there are any questions that maybe you wanted to go over with her or anything like that please feel free to get them in especially you know now that we have her here and you know the time to uh the first question comes from zoom and is regarding creating a separate business entity you know you mentioned that how would you go about creating a separate business entity yeah so a lot of people um, have found it to be an easy process. A lot of people find it to be a difficult process. If you try to do it yourself, um, you can, you're going to want to file it within your state and you can look up your state's information. I live in New Jersey, for example. Um, and I did this before I was an attorney. So it's doable. You can do it without an attorney. If you get confused, just hire somebody to do it with you. Um, you can Google like small business attorney in your state, file, find somebody who can file it for you. I know it can be more complicated depending what state you're in. Um, but for example, like if I were to Google New Jersey LLC formation, um, you're going to want to look for the website that has, that ends in like the actual government website. So like nj.us or .gov, whatever it might be. Um, let's see. So, and then if you click on most states have an application that's pretty easy to do online. Um, so if you go and you like click onto the actual state's website, you can find an application and um, try to see if you can do it yourself. You know, it's not, it's not like a super scary um, you can find guides online for free to help you with it, but if it's too overwhelming or too daunting, then just reach out and hire someone to do it. Great. Now, Frank wants to know, he's joining us here. Could you say a little bit more about the pros and cons of an LLC versus sole proprietorship or other structures? Yeah. Um, so an LLC is typically the the easiest and like the most common form of legal entity that small business owners go for. Um, 
being a sole proprietor, you're, you're not necessarily separating out as a separate legal entity. Um, an LLC is, it stands for limited liability corporation. So you're creating this separate business entity that has liability specifically through that for your business and your, per, you as a person are separated from that as well as like your personal assets and everything else. Um, the other entities, they're not as common for small businesses because they can get more um, convoluted when it comes to taxing. When you get to a certain tax bracket or like income, it may make more sense to become a corporation. Um, a lot of photographers will become S corps. It depends on your state talk to your accountant, see what makes sense, like tax benefit wise. Um, but the LLC is pr typically like pretty, pretty easy and um, pretty like standard. Cool. Now, Mark had a question regarding uh, kind of a, along the same lines. without creating a separate LLC, could he use a DBA under his wife already has an existing LLC? Okay. So it depends on what your wife's existing LLC is for, um, what the purpose of it is for. Um, I get this question often if businesses um, have multiple like branches or like say you're a wedding photographer and then you also have like a portrait photography company and then you also have like an educational brand. You don't need to go necessarily and create separate LLCs for all of this. It actually can become more complicated if you do um, for insurance purposes. And then like you're paying tax, like different fees for all of these different LLCs. Um, so if it's a similar purpose and you can, um, you know, categorize it as like, you know, you, you want to merge that like profit and loss and like tax information through the same LLC, same insurance, like all of those kinds of things. If it's, if it all kind of lines up, maybe you're both photographers, um, then you could create that separate DBA. Um, if your wife is like a private chef and you're a photographer, you, you should probably just start your own <laughs> LLC. <laughs> Unless, unless you're making photography based cakes, then maybe, 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 maybe it falls in line. <laughs> uh, so, so Frank wants to know, and uh, we also got a very similar question from Gray as well. At what point in the creative process should a photographer apply to copyright an image or group of images? Um, what's your feelings on that? Does it make sense to copyright images? How do you feel personally, yeah. professionally? Yeah. So I get this question often a lot as well. And I think there's a lot of confusion around like what it means to get a copyright or have a copyright or like, do you have to apply for a copyright? Copyright is a beautiful thing. The second that you create an original work of art, you automatically have a copyright. Like your work is automatically copyrighted to you unless otherwise specified in a contract. So you don't have to go out and apply for a federal copyright registration for an image or a group of images to have that protection. Where you might want to apply for copyright is if the image is getting a lot of press and coverage, essentially what that copyright application does is makes it easier to identify that image as yours, um, to assert damages for it, to um, sue somebody over like an improper use of your photo. Um, I have one photographer that I work with who is very, very well known, very like well regarded, has published multiple fine art books. And every time that, you know, her work is very iconic. So every time that um, images are released, she wants that those sets of images all copyrighted because um, they're bound to be redistributed and misappropriated without her permission used by brands or other photographers. Um, and she wants to have those strong copyright rights. Um, so that's a situation where like from the outset, you might want to have your work copyrighted. If you're not necessarily, um, you know, like showing these images out in the world or like, I don't know if you're going to, to start like getting a lot of press or coverage where you need that protection. Um, you know, it might, it would be more worth it to do it in that situation. Makes sense. Now I, I might mess this up. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I get your name wrong. I want to <laughs> say it's Hakob 
If I didn't, if I didn't get that right, I apologize. But uh, joining us from Facebook wants to know: Is trademark the same as registering the business and getting a business registration number, or is trademark something else we need to apply for separately? A trademark is something completely separate. So when you register your business in your state, you you have some trademark um, protection specifically in your state. So um, typically when you create your LLC or whatever business entity you might create, you have to do a search and make sure that there's not another business in that state with that name. So you have state protection, but a trademark is a federal registration of your name or logo or unique brand identifier. And that is extremely strong, totally different from registering your business. That's protecting your logo, your brand, your slogan, your, you know, whatever it might be that you want to protect. Um, that's like a separate added step, um, that you would take. Kind of like, kind of like paying your, your state taxes versus paying, you know, federal taxes. In a sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm picking this up. Maybe maybe I made the wrong choice. I'm going back to school. I'm, I'm, I'm going into this. Uh, so Sean wants to know, uh, at what point do you suggest a, a startup needing to take on business insurance? The second that you take on paying clients. Like the second that you're you're providing a service or a product and you're out there in the world, you're exposing yourself to legal liability. Um, so you could do one job and go on one event, one project. And on that very first job, somebody could trip over your bag and, or a wire to like lighting or something and sue you. And without insurance, you know, you're, you're paying for your legal um, fees and defense out of pocket or, you know, whatever might happen without having that insurance in place, you know, you're, you're bearing that cost and that risk and that liability insurance isn't a lot. If you're like, you know, I know it can, it can be like even $400 or $500 a year. Um, you know, depending on like how much business you're doing and like what kind of business you're doing, of course it can get, get up there, the more like equipment you have and the more, um, risk exposure you have, but you can get it pretty cheaply. And I know, um, like PPP, the professional photographer, something they have, they have an option that's, relatively inexpensive. Um, what's the other one? Hill and Usher has a photographer's policy. So yeah, they, there's options out there. There's plenty of options out there that aren't super expensive. Got it. Now, James wants to know, in terms of contract templates, do those need to be adjusted based from state to state? No. So I sell contract templates in our shop. Um, and there is at the very bottom, there is a section where it says like insert state here. And that's basically it. Um, the only thing that varies state to state is really is like whether or not you can charge a credit card fee. And um, if you're purchasing a contract template from an attorney, they'll usually call that out. Um, so I know like, you know, I have what states allow you to charge that credit card processing fee. And, you know, if you're in one of those states, you can't, you can't charge that fee. If you're not, then you can. Um, so those, that's like the one situation where, you know, photography related contracts might cheat, might differ ever so slightly. Um, but a contract template, a proper one should call that out. Got it. Now, this is more of a, of a, I guess, maybe personal opinion question. You know, I want to kind of go back to the beginning of the webinar when you were kind of introing yourself. You, you sort of, you know, made a, a comment about, you know, like going to the dentist, you know, and yeah. I, think, I, think that's, I think that's a good kind of, you know, analogy because, I mean, I, I'll be the first one out there to say it that, you know, I'm terrified of the dentist, you know, you always go in there. They always have bad news for me, you know. <laughs> yep. But why do you why do you think there's this like I guess the the proper word maybe like a stigmata against you know going and and hiring a proper attorney or lawyer you know to to help you through the steps? Why why is that you know around there and and what as being on both sides of you know kind of the coin there as a photographer and a lawyer you know how do you suggest people work around that and and find the value in that? Yeah. I mean, I think it is, it's overwhelming. Typically speaking, it's very um, 
archaic the way that like legally is is written um i in law school the first year you have to take a legal writing class and one of the things like the first things our professor taught us was that the old way of legal writing and like the way most contracts are formatted are like hard to understand and read it's like thou shall not art thou shall and it doesn't read natural it's hard to decipher and understand um it's really not necessary and modern judges and lawyers don't prefer it like we want to say the client will pay 10 percent of the late fee not like thou client shall thus pay you know we don't you don't need to like write like that anymore and i think that a lot of old contracts are written that way and that like that connotation kind of like comes from that like old man club of you know language that doesn't need to be like written that way i don't know i think it it, it comes from that and um you know i i like to make law like a lot more straightforward a lot more to the point um and a little bit more modern and that's the way that that like the legal world is is going um but i i get it because it's it's not fun it's overwhelming it's daunting like even sometimes my head spins and i'm like i have to read this like 10 times to fully <laughs> fully understand it um so you know i get it yeah makes sense so can you see any benefit from being an llc if art photography is the focus and not client-based photography. Yeah, definitely. So even if, you know, you're not serving a client and you're still making your, say you're just doing commission work, right? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean just like personal work? Um, this is a question that was sent in. So maybe, maybe Gray, if you want to follow up on that and, you know, just kind of specify that we can get that answer for you and, you know, Maggie be more yeah. than happy. Um, in the meantime, we'll take the next question and we can always come back to that. Um, do you recommend any specific payment options in terms of that? Are there ones that you wouldn't accept, you know, Venmo versus PayPal? Are there way to, ways to go ahead and protect your payments, you know, instead of just a personal contract? What's your feelings on those? Definitely. Um, so this is another thing that I've had clients run into where um, they say that a client makes a payment, has a dispute with you. They may just file like a credit card dispute or a PayPal dispute, um, even if your contract protects you to get that money back. And then you're kind of like at the hands of the credit card company or their bank or PayPal. Um, PayPal is very consumer friendly. They're not, they usually side on the side of the consumer. Um, so I personally don't even offer PayPal as an option because I don't want to deal with that. Um, you can make sure that your contract protects you if there is like a, a chargeback of any sort. Um, you know, you want to make sure your contract is super clear for those kinds of situations, how you can, you know, then like, you know, go after them if you have to recoup any fees that were rightfully owed to you. Um, but I think, you know, pay, PayPal is the one that's kind of like a little bit questionable questionable yeah you can get yeah can for get the dicey. business for the for the business owner makes sense now becky's joining us here on facebook and said they that she lives in massachusetts currently and in the town she lives in they allow her to get a dba certificate how would that differ from an llc does she need both yeah so a dba stands for doing business as so typically you would file a dba say you register your LLC as like, I don't know, Becky does photos LLC, but then like you brand your business as, you know, I don't know, something different, something like more eloquent or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, then you would file a doing business as a DBA to say this LLC is doing business as this brand. And you can file, there was a similar question earlier about doing um, a DBA under somebody's wife's LLC or their partner's LLC. Um, so you can file a DBA, like multiple D DBAs. So you might have like Becky weddings, Becky portraits, Be Becky like educational courses for photographers. And you might have one main LLC and then DBA is that kind of just like offset of that. Got it. Got it. Now we did get some clarification on the previous question. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll reread it back to you just to, you know, keep it fresh in your mind. 
Um, so the question was, can you see any benefit from being an LLC if art photography is the focus, not client-based photography? And the follow-up, they were saying that they're considering personal ex exhibition work for sale, not commissioned work. Yeah. Yeah. So because you're making a profit and you're selling that, that work, um, say in an exhibition, having an LLC would still give you um, a separate entity to file your profit and loss through like that separate business bank account, which is going to make it a lot easier come tax time to just have, like, I like having one account and it's like all my profit goes into that, all my loss expenses, everything comes out of that. And then I'm not going through like my personal accounts. Things aren't like, you know, what's personal, what's business. It's super clear, easy for taxes, easy for your accountant. Um, I don't know what kind of like liability or risks you might have doing personal art that's in exhibitions. Um, but if say like your work was ever misappropriated, like, or taken photos of, or I don't know, you might want to have insurance if you're having your photos in an exhibition and say something got damaged, like whose fault is that you might want to have insurance for those kinds of things too. So having an LLC to have insurance, like, you know, just all clearly organized and professionally set, um, isn't a bad idea. Makes sense. Now let's uh, let's wrap everything up here because you know yeah. we 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 only have Maggie on retainer for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where can people find you? Where can people you know go to check out some of your work? You know maybe if they're looking for a lawyer and they decided you know what Maggie's the right one for me. How can they get in touch with you? Yeah. Um. So my name's Maggie Fisher. It's M A G I F I S H E R. You can go to maggiefisher.com. You can find everything there. It will take you to the artist lawyer. It will take you to my photography if you want to check it out, my team. Um, everything is just right on that link, maggiefisher.com, maggiefisher on Instagram. Um, and I did create a discount code too for our contract template. So if anybody needed, like we have like a trademark guide and all kinds of stuff in our shop on the artist lawyer. Um, so I created the code BH photo. Um, which awesome. for 20% off. So we can share that too. Awesome. Excellent. That's, that's absolutely wonderful. So if you're looking for, for any of that, you know, Maggie just dropped that in the, in the link below. So we'll share that to everybody. Use that discount code. If you're looking to get some of those services, Maggie, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, and thank you guys. yeah we really appreciate it. We really appreciate you taking some, some of your time out of your day. We know it's super busy and it's, you know, wedding season and everything. So I'm sure you've got a ton going on. So we really do appreciate it. Um, for everybody at home, we really hope this was helpful to you and you got some maybe questions answered and maybe, you know, demystified some of those things that, you know, people are always apprehensive about when it comes to all this stuff, the LLCs, the copyrights and everything. So really appreciate it. As you know, this has been another rendition of the DH Virtual Event Space in the Books. We'll catch you all next time.